Hi, everybody. Welcome, Day Drinkers. Welcome to Day Drinking with Authors, uh, the interview series where I pick a book, the author picks a drink, and we discuss both. Um, because I get to choose all these books, it is just, I'm, I'm, it's so lucky what I get to read. And this week's was incredibly special. It's called Carolina Built by Kiana Alexander. And it's the, it's historical fiction, but it's based on the real life story of a woman named Joe Leary. And we're going to get into her life in a big way. Um, Kiana did a lot of amazing research, but I'm going to read the back cover copy because my mom likes that. And my mom would really like this book. So would my aunt Sherry. Aunt Sherry, if you're listening, you would really like this book. So here we go. Carolina Built. Josephine N. Leary is determined to build a life of her own and a future for her family. When she moves to Edenton, North Carolina, from the plantation where she was born, she is free, newly married, and ready to follow her dreams. As the demands of life pull Josephine's attention away, it becomes increasingly difficult for her to pursue her real estate aspirations. She finds herself immersed in deepening her marriage, mothering her daughters, and being a dutiful daughter and granddaughter. Still, she manages to teach herself to be a businesswoman, to manage her finances, and to make smart investments in the local real estate market. But with each passing year, it grows more and more difficult to focus on building her legacy from the ground up. Filled with passion and perseverance, Josephine Leary is frankly a woman that everyone should know. This is That's a quote from... Um, I'm going to mess up her first name. I'm so sorry. Sadika Johnson, who's the author of Yellow Wife. If you haven't read that, it's a beautiful book. And her story speaks to the part of us that dares to dream bigger, tear down whatever stands in our way, and build something better for the loved ones we live behind. We leave behind. So let's bring in Kiana. Hi, Kiana. Hi. How you doing? <laughs> I'm good. Thank you so much for taking the time to talk to us. You and I had a, a brief chat and you have been, you're like one of the few authors I've had on who's been doing a lot of in-person events. It's like we were doing nothing and suddenly you were like hitting the ground running. How have you been doing with the, with the promotion of this book? It was, uh, it was exhausting and exhilarating <laughs> at the same time. It was like the book just came out February 22nd. So we're like a week and some change out from release. And like, I started traveling before it came out by a few days. So I started on the 19th traveling and traveled all the way until the 27th. So I hit four cities um, across the state of North Carolina to do events. And more and socializing. Right. <laughs> it's been like a lot of virtual, um, a lot of virtual things like this um, talks given to like corporations and stuff like that in between the traveling. So it's been really, really interesting. Um, and it's the first time I've really been out on the street since 2019. Yeah, shell shock a little bit, huh? Um, yeah, I was just like, wow, I'm rusty at this. This is this is really hitting. So, but yeah, it was a lot of fun. I've had, a, I've had a really good time. I didn't realize how much I missed interacting with readers and sort of kind of being in the room with them to feed off of the excitement and the enthusiasm they have for a story is really nice. Um, and that sometimes doesn't translate when you're doing something virtual. So it was nice to get some of that energy back. Yeah, it is. It is remarkable. It's so solitary writing a book. And then in the last few years, promoting a book has been so solitary. And, you know, I, I'm speaking to you and you and I are having a face to face conversation, but there are a bunch of people watching and there will be a bunch of people listening and you don't have you don't get to get any of that energy back. So it is nope. <laughs> these are strange days. So let's talk about this beautiful book, first of all. And I'm so sorry that I, I read the book on my um, e-reader. This cover, the cover. I have it. <laughs> Put that baby up there. So I really like to hear the story of how covers um, come to be. Gosh, it's gilt all over the place on that thing, too. Yeah, they it, they use like this kind of gold leaf on the jacket to kind of bring out the gold. Um, it was actually like when I saw the cover image, it was actually rendering on screen like kind of a yellow color. I didn't realize they were going in this direction until I got my author copies. And I was like, wow, that's pretty. It's sparkly. So, I love sparkly things. <laughs> was that the first image? Was like that the first cover concept you saw, or were there other things? Like wh when you opened that email, where you were like, "Yes, yep." This yes. is basically the first. The only thing that we changed, like it started out pretty much this way. The woman that you see in the center, um, and the gold leaf was always there. Like I said, it appeared yellow on the screen, but it was always there. The only thing we really changed was the background color. We went oh. through several different, like like the Pantone colors of, of 
pink and fuchsia to kind of figure out which one was going to pop the most. So that was really the only major change. She was always there. She was always in black and white. Um, Is that her? No, that's not oh. her. That's a cover model. Um, and we thought that the thought among like the staff, especially at the publishing house, was that if we used an, a real image of Josephine, that people would think it was a biography. So we wanted to make mm. it clear that it was historical fiction. Smart. That's really smart. So tell us, start us at the beginning. How did jo, Josephine Leary come into your life? Like, how did you find out about her? Because this is a story, I mean, unless you walk yeah. down that, walk by that building. Uh, it, it happened once upon the timeline on the Twitters. Um, <laughs> oh, way back in old ye Twitter time. <laughs> yes. Um, I got on Twitter in 2011 at the behest of my good friend and critique partner, Kaya Alderson, who wrote Sisters in Arms that came out yeah. last August, which is a brilliant novel about uh, the 6th Triple Eight um, Battalion in the World War II, the Postal Battalion. So she was like yammering at me for ages, like, you have to get on Twitter. You have to get on Twitter. Like, I'm an introvert. I was already stressed out by Facebook. And I was like, I can't. I can't do another social media. And she was like, you have to get on Twitter because it's where all the networking happens. You have to do it. All the publishing people are on Twitter. So I was like, oh, fine. She nagged me onto Twitter. I got a Twitter account. And um, mostly she was right. Like, that's pretty much where the networking has happened. I've followed a bunch of editors and agents, like, pretty much immediately once I got on. Um, and most of the other people I'm following are other authors. Um, there's some readers, reviewers mm -hmm. and stuff, but it's mostly colleagues and people in the industry. Yeah. So 2019, springtime, I'm strolling down the, the timeline. And I've been following um, Sarah Younger on Twitter for a while. And I saw that she was tweeting and she had said that she was in Edenton. And I think she was standing by the building and maybe looking at the historical marker. And she was like, mm, this doesn't make any sense to me. Like, I'm from North Carolina. Why haven't I heard of this remarkable person that did all these amazing things? Someone should write a book about her. Who's going to write this book for me? And you're like, well, I'm and I was like, oops, I will. Like, I uh, replied to her tweet. I'll do it. And it's not something I would normally have done because A, introvert. <laughs> B, it was just sort of a random occurrence. And a lot of times I would have seen something like that. I'm like, oh, that's cool. Maybe I'll go look right. up and kind of kept scrolling. But something told me to reply. So I replied. And to my surprise, she replied back. And I was like, okay. Um, so we start talking, took it to the DMs. And then we decided to meet up at RWA that year. It was in New York. That was the last RWA I went to um, in July. And we met in the lobby had like a good old fashioned meeting, talked about my career, um, talked about Mrs. Leary. And she's like, well, what kind of, you know, what, do you, what what's your vision? Do you have a vision for this story? And I told her what I'd been thinking because it had been probably two or three months since the tweet. So I had some time to do a little bit of research, kind of think about the angle I would take to approach the story. So we talked about that. And she was like, well, I know your work. Um, I've seen what you can do. I, I know you have a long history in publishing. You're experienced. Um, and I, I'd love to represent you. Um, so she became my agent <laughs> from that. And I'm just like, I'm just sitting there like, oh, snap. So I signed on with her and we took several more months of me doing research, working on a proposal. I ended up with like a 40, 50 page proposal um, of what I wanted to do, like what the story was going to be about. OK, I'm going to look at this 20 year period of her life. Here's all the neat stuff she did. Uh, here's what I know about her. Here's how I'm going to here's my research methodology. Um so they would know what I intended. And then she took that out on submission and it went to auction and it sold mm, not quite a year from the from the tweet. Not quite a year. My God. Two months from the tweet. I would think it's about that, about 10 months from the tweet it sold at auction. It was the biggest advance of my career. Um, and it just, it, it was so many things had to line up for it to happen the way it happened. I know that it was meant to be. Yeah, I, I mean, oh, yeah. I, so much of it is that lightning strike of you doing something you wouldn't normally do, right? Yeah, like, I just felt like pushed. Like, I felt like a no. gentle push to reply. Because typically, I would have been like, oh, my God, she's like this powerhouse agent. Like, there's no way, like, she's going to pay attention to little old me over here grinding in category romance. Like, it's nothing. But something told me to reply, and I did. And 
it, it also says something about following your intuition, listening to your inner voice, um, the things that can happen when you do and the things you can miss out on when you don't. Don't. Yeah. You know, can I, I've heard some crazy shit in publishing and that might be the best. <laughs> right. This is, this is a wild story. I've been telling this story for two weeks now to like everybody because everybody's asking me that. Like, well, how did you find out about yeah. it? And they, the face is always the same when I say from Twitter. They're like, what? <laughs> this is my dog barking because I shut my office door. Hold on. One of course. <laughs> Sorry, we may have we we both may have uh, Sound of it. animal animal <laughs> kingdom things. So so you 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 didn't know anything about her before. No, this I am a native North Carolinian too, and I had never heard of her. Um, eighth grade was North Carolina history, like the entire social studies course for the entire eighth grade year, both semesters was studying North Carolina history. We studied everything from the Lost Colony to the Reagan administration. Oh my! Lord. And she was never mentioned, and I'm just like. I don't understand why, but I do understand why. Yeah. Um, and it's like, it's, it's frustrating because I know once you find one, it's like, oh my gosh, there have to be so many others whose stories have not been told that have been purposely hidden. Mm -hmm. And now it's like, now I got to go looking for those people too. Yeah. You, <laughs> this yeah. Not... This, I mean, <laughs> what's interesting about the answering that tweet is it's not just this book. Now you have this whole new direction. Yeah. Who should you choose to, to keep going of like, I'm definitely going to keep going. Our, this oh. is what I wanted. I mean, I started out in romance because I love reading romance. Romance comes easily to me to write. I felt like um, it was approachable. It would help me build an audience. There are all these reasons I went to romance first, but my dream was always to segue into historical fiction. I've, I've written some historical romances too, mm -hmm. but historical fiction has always been where I wanted to go. But the thing was, Timing never seemed right. There, there was never the event or the figure right. that ever came across my knowing that was the one I felt was right for me. Like the thing that I was supposed to write historical fiction about just never seemed to be there. Like nothing so struck better. me, you know, nothing <laughs> lit the fire of passion yeah. in me to write about until Mrs. Leary. Oh. Like immediately, I just went looking online to find everything I could about her. And there wasn't a whole lot but I knew where to look. So once I found out where to look, that was it. I was well, off to the races. This is kind of interesting because she is like, it, it, she is, she is a person we've heard nothing about or know nothing about. However, like from reading your author note at the beginning of the book, it sounds like someone took great care to save so much of her stuff. Can you talk about like, you know, you, you went to this special library and you requested the material and what those things were like, what was in well, that box? Credit goes, credit for that goes to Josephine's oldest daughter, Clara. Wow. Um, yeah, I felt that way. Who that grew up, here. who grew up with uh, actually great admiration for her mother and all the work that she did. She, she saw her mother, she saw her labor. She saw her determination. She saw the things she accomplished and grew up to be a woman who had great admiration for her mother's work. She saved the papers first. Um, after she passed away, those papers were left to her grandson, Josephine's grandson, who was Clara's only child. His name was Percy Almeria Reeves. Um, and he lived well into the 20th century. He died in the early 90s. Um, but he was cleaning his house because he knew that the time was coming where he would not be able to live on his own anymore. He's getting old. Um, and he was going to go into assisted living. So he found his grandmother's papers and he had the wherewithal to donate them. So he donated them to Duke University. And so now they're housed in the Rubenstein Library of Rare Books and Manuscripts. Wow. Four so big what was that like? It's, it's family photographs. Um, it's letters that she wrote to her family members. It's like personal, almost like journal uh, entries. It's the handwritten instructions for her building, um, contracts, deeds. It's some of everything in there. Um, and like being able to go to, I had to register as a researcher at Duke um, and go into the room where they have those slanted tables and they, they get the gloves and they bring you the big box and it's kind of dusty and, you know, they take the lid off and they tell you, you can't touch anything directly. Everything has plastic sleeves and stuff. Like being able to look at a photograph of her that was taken while she was alive, like the original photograph in my hand, holding the papers that she held, looking at the paper, the deed and seeing her signature. Like that was like deep for me. That's part of the process, like experiencing who she was 
as a person firsthand through things that she herself created or touched yeah. like that that really helped me kind of get in touch with who she was as a person and that was like I don't know it just I don't even know how long I was in there honestly I don't know how long I was in that room um with the archivist watching over me to make sure it didn't damage anything like I don't know how long I was in there but it was just I Were just you was to take absorbed. pictures of anything or did yes, you have to... I took oh, okay. like loads of pictures. I have like a whole Google Docs folder with photographs I took of things. So you could either take pictures um, or you could have them scan things and make copies. Um, so I thought it easier to take pictures. So I took a whole lot of pictures and immediately uploaded them to my Google Cloud. So I have like a bunch of pictures I took of her documents and stuff. Some of them ended up in the back of the book, mm -hmm. um, like the barbershop um, menu with the hairstyles and the prices on it. Um, and that little image of her signature from one of her contracts, like some of those are pictures I took um, from items in the archive. Wow. So like, was there was there part of that research that that shocked you or surprised you or changed the way the book was written? For those of you who might not have read the book, um, can you can you just tell I realize like we're 16 minutes into this conversation and I have <laughs> If you have not read this book, you might be wondering, who's Joe Leary? Can you just tell us a tiny bit about her and then answer the question about, did any of that research change the way you saw her or, or approached the book? Okay, so Josephine Napoleon Williams Leary was born in 1856 on a plantation in Williamson, North Carolina. We're not sure which plantation um, because the family that owned her, who was the namesake of the town, owned several plantations in Williamston. So she was emancipated at the age of nine years old. Um, when she was 17, she would marry um, Archer Sweetie Leary. Sweetie was the nickname everyone called him. Um, he was a man from Petersburg, Virginia, also formerly enslaved, likely Octoroon or one eighth black. No images exist of Sweetie, but firsthand wow. accounts of how he looked describe him as very fair skinned, dark, wavy hair, dark eyes. Um, light enough that he could pass for white. So they married when he was in his early 20s and she was 17. Um, and at the same year, she purchased her first property, which was a piece of land on Road Street in Elizabeth City. And she purchased that for $550. Um, that money was a gift from her father, who was a white man, a Confederate colonel who otherwise never acknowledged her, um, except for that money. So she took that money and started her business with it. Um, over the course of the next 20 years from that first property purchase, she would purchase five more properties. If you added up the value of all six of those properties in 2017, the valuation was around $10 million. Oh my God. Isn't that, and she, and she is the only woman who, who, who had that sort of business at that time. Yes. Yes. Okay. So when you're researching about her, what, did, what surprised you? What did anything change the way that you looked at the story? Well, finding out that, A, that she had started so young, I didn't know that when I first began. When I first started hearing At 17, like, I was kind of blown by that because I'm like, I know good and well at 17, I wasn't thinking like that. Like, and 17 year old me could never. Like, I was in her honeymoon. She her bought being, property on yeah, her honeymoon. Her being so young um, and thinking so far ahead, like, really just caught my attention. And then the fact that she took, money that represented the only acknowledgement she would ever receive from the man who sired her and built her own empire and legacy with it. I think yeah. just speaks a lot to the forethought that she had, even yeah. at such a young age. Well, it's, it's interesting. You do such an amazing job of like she, her mother is, her mother is alive and we hear a little bit about her experience when she was enslaved to the mom, um, but her mother's life and her grandmother is still alive. So the yes. idea that she is going to spend the rest of her life taking advantage of the freedom that she has and making the most of it mm -hmm. as like a, you know, a motive that sails through the entire book was like so crystal clear. And, and I, I just found that part of it so moving. Like she was just not going to be styled. Yeah, she was, she was a child, but because she wasn't like emancipated like two or three, she was old enough that she had her own memories of what it was like to be enslaved. And then on top of that, her mother and her grandmother had decades yeah. 
of experience. And her husband, trauma, right? Yeah, and trauma of what it was like to be property. So mm -hmm. taking that perspective and looking at what freedom could mean, I think really affected her and the way that she made decisions for her business. Um, she was determined that her daughters would not have to suffer the kind of things that she suffered, that they would never that they would never know what it was like to be in that kind of poverty, the way that right. the family struggled after being emancipated. I mean, there was a lot of work to be done. We don't know exactly, but from what we know from the historical narrative, um, we assume that her family sharecropped in the mm. Williamson area, which is where the prologue comes from. Right. Um, they sharecropped in the Williamson area for years after they were emancipated to build up enough money so that they could finally move away from the place that they were enslaved. So, and that was typical. Um, people would have to figure out, okay, am I going to farm? Am I going to yeah. apply a trade? What am I going to do to support myself and now build up a life where before my life belonged totally to someone else? And she understood, oh, yeah. like she understood that there, it, it's freedom, but then there's also freedom and money, right? Like that, that there's, mm -hmm. The thing that she, she could pass that. on. Yeah. That part of the reason that the people who owned her had so much control and so much power is because they were wealthy. Yeah. So she could see the connection between wealth and freedom. Yeah. When she wealth goes in choice, when she buys the house, when she buys her mm -hmm. house from the, from the white man that owns mm -hmm. her house. And it's like, we, we are going to, we are going to erase that. Like we, he will not own where we live. Right. Right. I, yeah. Um, one of the things that I was so struck by while I was reading it was there were two, there were two big things. One was that the worst thing that happens in their lives happens before this book starts. So the, the narrative of this story is, I mean, and I mean, there's, there's struggle and there's, I mean, there's a lot of like mm -hmm. human, particularly within the marriage, a lot of human mm -hmm. uh, tension um, and conflict, but the, the, the whole of the story is really is about building and joy and, and family and, and making something where there wasn't anything. And there's no point where you're scared, like you're reading it and you're worried and you're scared. Like, it, and I'm wondering, was that intentional on your very. part? Like you wanted it to be this joyful. Tell me about that. It was very intentional. Um, honestly speaking, if you are looking to see Black people in pain, um, Black trauma, there are plenty of places that you can go for that. Um, the news, yeah. um, anything made by Lena Waith, there are plenty of places you can go to watch uh, trauma porn if you want to see Black people suffer. That's not what I'm about. Um, it's not ever been what I'm about in any of my books. And I think when we're talking about historical fiction, looking at the time period, Yes, there was going to be some suffering and there was some, but this sense of mortal danger that's always hanging over us, there ought to be some escape from that. Mm -hmm. There ought to be some respite and some rest from that constant state of anxiety and worry. And so even though we're telling a story at a time where those sorts of things were maybe even more intense than they are today, that doesn't mean that it has to all be put on the page. Yeah. So that was very much intentional because I, I think there's enough of that. There's plenty of that out there. There's plenty of trauma porn out there. That ain't what I do. That's yeah. not my thing. And there aren't, one of the things that I, you get, you get swept up in it. I mean, she, she and sweetie stay married. They're, they are married. There's some conflict that is conflict that I have in my marriage. It might be mm -hmm. like, it is the most universal conflict, which is uh, a mother. He wants her to stay home. She wants mm -hmm. to you know, be out. She wants to have control of the money. You know, she wants to dream bigger and have control of her money. And he doesn't make the distinction between what is hers is his and his is, you know, like that. It's also universal. Her, her children survive, her grandmother lives to be a lot like an old woman. Like her grandmother lived to be like 102, I think. She I died mean, in the 1900s. She was born in like 1804, I think. She died in maybe 1906, something like that. She she lived into a ripe old age. So as a writer, mm -hmm. were you like 
was it hard to like create story? I mean, I got swept up in these stories of like, oh, they've got, how do they change the, what's in the middle of the mattresses? Like, and they're both going to do this? Like, you, you gave <laughs> oh, us the this feathers, yeah. <laughs> I was like, they're going to do this with corn husks? It's you know, just like, and, yeah. Sometimes yeah. they would use feathers and sometimes corn husks. Corn husks were the cheaper option. Um, so you could kind of shred them down and they made kind of this fluffy material that you could use. For mattresses but after a while they go flat and you'd have to open up the cover dump the old ones out and put new ones in and that was just something you did like twice a year you know spring cleaning that kind of thing um you just gave us this real domestic mm -hmm. story that had that was just fascinating like there was a lot of like researching and reading about like 19th century life which is something i've done before because like i said i've written historical romance so mm -hmm. i kind of had an I already had a solid basis of knowledge of what type of things went down in the 19th century household. Right. Um, but in terms of like the conflict between Sweetie and Josephine, that's really tied into patriarchy and gender roles and 200 some odd years later, so much of that has not changed. <laughs> why is it, why is it still, why is it still like that? Like, are what? we not, are we not evolving here? Like it, it's, it's hilarious and also sad how similar things are in terms of gender roles and expectations that are foisted upon women and femme identifying people as yeah. to what they're supposed to do and what they ain't supposed to do. Like, when are we going to get past this? <laughs> well, and it, I found it, I found it really like her, when she, when she has her first daughter, Clara, and she is so t upset, not upset, torn about her feelings like that, that, she loves being a mother. She's a very good mother, but she wants to be back at work. She wants to be back in her business. And that, that was not, you know, she was bucking the norms at that time, but like that push pull is something that's so universal. Another thing that I found so universal and like um, fulfilling in this story was how she sort of, I mean, she has her mom and her grandmother who are big forces in her life, but she surrounds herself with these other women. Mm -hmm. Like she gets this little girl gang going, you yeah. know, like, <laughs> financial advisors, a woman, she's, mm -hmm. she's renting her space out to other women who own businesses, which had to be pretty, like, I would think that that was different, but maybe that's my own, uh, you know, ignorance about, but like, it just felt like she was like, gathering up this girl gang can you talk about the research that led you there well i looked at edenton as a town and because it's a port town um it 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 sits right on the edge of edenton bay which opens out into the atlantic ocean so you had a lot of maritime traffic coming in and out bringing either passengers or cargo to be used in edenton or shipped into points beyond further into the interior of the state so because you had such a mix of people coming and going all the time, most of the things that your average person would need, um, they would be able to find in Edenton, even though it was a small town. Like, it's still a small town today. I think the population is like 5,000. So the barber, the butcher, that kind of stuff, like, you'd be able to find that there. Um, and a lot of the businesses and stuff I found in the local newspaper of the time was a Black newspaper called The Fisherman and Farmer. And it's been like microfilmed and archived online. So you can go and read the paper. It's a database. You can go and log into it um, through the library system and read the paper. So I did. I read the papers from those 20 years. And I found a lot of little social. They have like a classified. It looks like a classified section, but it's little social notes. Oh, um, so it'll oh, say something wow. like, Josephine Leary returns from visiting family in Washington. It's like two sentences about whatever's going on in the neighborhood. A lot of the scenes in the book came from that. There was one that said, Clara Leary serenaded by young men of town. I turned it into a scene. So that's where a lot of the scenes came from. Same thing with the businesses. There were ads in the newspaper, just like there are ads in the newspaper now. Yeah. Um, like Louis Ziegler, the cabinet maker slash undertaker. <laughs> real person. <laughs> yeah. A real person. That was his real business. He had an ad in The Fisherman and Farmer. Same with O. Newman, who owned that general store where she went to buy clothes for the family. So those are real people. Wow. A lot of the the seamstress um, and the farmer and his The leather daughter. worker. Yeah. Those people are fictional, but there's like a nice mixture, about 60, 40 of real people versus uh, fictional characters because there was so much information either in the social section or in the ads in the newspaper. 
So that was how I created um, sort of the, the town as a character itself with all these other people who live there and work there. You had and said- The girl gang is like, I mean, that's reflective of, that's reflective of the kind of person that I imagine Josephine was in that being a strong-willed woman, she would want other strong-willed women around mm -hmm. her. Um, and it's also reflective of my own experience. I've tried to keep uh, like- close relationships with women and like as friendships. And it's like, I like to be friends with people that run the gamut of age, mm -hmm. some friends younger than me and a lot of friends older than me because the, the perceptions change so much over the course of your life. And it's like the younger friends kind of keep you, give you a fresh perspective on things that are happening that you're not aware of anymore. Cause you don't look here. It's like right. the things that you overlook now, they can bring right. it to the forefront. And then the older friends, they have all this life experience that you haven't had yet. So now they impart all this wisdom to you. And that's how you get Ida and Izzy. Those are yeah. reflective of my older friendships with someone like Rosa and the little girls in the, in the junior auxiliary being yeah. reflective of younger friendships. So it's kind of like that gamut of friendship. It's such a like, it adds such a richness to your life because now yeah. you're getting all this perspective, all this wisdom from women in different stages of life. And I would imagine that she was, and I, I mean, you do a great job, uh, particularly in that junior women's club, the junior league, um, where where people were coming to her for advice. Mm -hmm. Like she's such a trailblazer. They're like, "What do I, what do I do with money? Yeah. <laughs> where, where, where do I put it?" You like, know, you seem to understand this stuff. Explain it to yeah. me. <laughs> You had said when we were chatting before the interview mm -hmm. that you felt such a kinship with her. Like, how long have you been living with her, kind of in your in your brain? Almost three years at this point, because it was spring of 2019 when I saw the tweet. So ever since the tweet, I've been thinking about thinking about her life, looking into her life, trying to find up as, as much as I could information about her life and just thinking about like what it must have been like to be her in the time that she was living and how it must have been like probably equal parts like joy and frustration, just trying mm -hmm. to figure out how she was going to do the thing that was in her heart to do. And it's like the, this idea of trying to balance mothering with running a business or being a businesswoman is where I feel like the most kinship with her mm -hmm. because I have two kids. I mean, they're not like small kids anymore. They're 11 and 15, but there's still a lot of neediness that mm -hmm. goes on there. There's still the managing of Oh, somebody's got to go to an appointment. Somebody needs the dentist. Somebody's going to play soccer, whatever. Like all those things, the social calendars of the kids and stuff. You got to manage all that stuff. Keep the household running. For heaven's sake, we can't run out of Cheez-Its. Like, <laughs> all the things that go into running a household and taking care of those kids. And then here I am, I'm trying to write books and then I'm speaking. And then I'm in all these other works are in various stages of production. So I've got to edits on this books and revisions yeah. on this books and marketing on that book. So it's just like this constant cycle of things just coming in and out. And it's like, it's really like that Miss Magazine cover where the lady has eight hands. She's got like an iron, an iron and a frying pan and a book and all the things. And you're just trying to keep all the balls in the air. Yeah, That is, you know, tied into, still tied into gender roles and patriarchy. It has not changed. The same thing that I'm doing, she was doing, trying yeah. to find balance among all these things you're trying to do, all these things you're passionate about. You love your children. You love your work. You want to have time for yourself. You want to have friends. Like it's all this stuff. You're going busy on. being a trailblazer. You got to. <laughs> <thing. laughs> so um, what, like, has she led you to other interesting women? What, can you tell us anything about what you're working on next? Well, I have like other projects that are like forthcoming, but it's like in terms of historical fiction, I have several different subjects about which I want to write. And so now the thing is, how are we going to determine who gets to go next? Who so I discovered all these um, historical figures and some of them I was aware of before. And I just started thinking about them more seriously after writing Carolina Bill. One of them is Dr. Anna Julia Cooper. I really <gasps> want to write a historical fiction about her and a lot has been written about her and by her because she lived so far into the 20th century. She lived to like 1965. Um, and so there's stuff that she wrote herself. But so much has been said about her academic career and her political stances and things like that. But not a lot has been said about her personal life. 
Um, and I really want to look into that, um, like the aspects of how she viewed education and its importance yeah. in the life of like recently freed people. And like that, Girls. that's really interesting to me because I, I, I have a, I just really love uh, librarians and teachers. And she was like the penultimate teacher. Um, so I have a lot of interest in her. We haven't been able to figure out the direction of that. Um, but that's a that's in the back of my mind. Um, same thing with Charlotte Hawkins Brown. It's, it's a similar story. Oh. She started a school uh, in the Charlotte area, North Carolina, for uh, recently free young Black girls. Um, and there's the same kind of thread through that about education and the importance it has in determining the potential for success that a person yeah. has, especially when you're talking about people who, you know, it was literally illegal to teach them to read. Now you're giving them a whole new world of opportunity by educating them. So there's people like that. Then um, Hiram Revels, I'm interested in him. He was the first African-American in Senate, uh, oh, in Congress. Yeah. And he, he took the seat that was vacated by Jefferson Davis when Jefferson Davis went to be president of the Confederacy. So in 1870, when Congress reconvened, he took that seat. There's um, a lot there. And That's he's from Fayetteville, which is like the town in North Carolina where I live now. So there's all these like stories like that where I feel like their names aren't known or they haven't really been delved into. Um, and then I have my like fictional stuff. Like I'm working on, um, I'm working on a, a historical mystery, like a Regency mystery series. Oh, fun. Let's get ready to go out on submission. So that's like very much, <laughs> it's very much fictional, but it's going to have the same kind of real world topics that I try to bring into all my books that are like significant and pertinent to the time period. That's awesome. Um, so I like, have like a million ideas. Like ideas are not a problem. Time is the problem. Yeah. And this is the exciting, it it's yeah. the exciting and frustrating part where like everything feels shiny, but like getting to the next step of it, getting to the next step of it, you, mm -hmm. you know, it's kind of you hit roadblocks of interest or research or whatever. Like that it, it is, but it is like, oh, over here. Oh, over here. Like it's, it's an exciting yeah. thing. It's very much like, oh, all the shiny ideas and like not knowing <laughs> which thing to chase after. Yeah. So, I mean, my agent helps me like sort of corral that. Like she'll tell me what she thinks is like cogent right now based on what she knows about the market. And that kind of helps direct me into what I'm working on next. So I kind of just dump all my ideas on her. I'm like, this is all the stuff I want to write. And she's like, tell me what okay, to do. <laughs> that's a lot. Let's start with this one. And we'll put oh, these on the side. <laughs> Oh, well, I can't wait. Please keep us posted on the, uh, on the Victorian mystery, Regency mystery. Sorry. That's what you said. Regency yes. Mystery. Yes. It's like, fun. it's the proposals done. Like it's getting ready to go out on submission, like very soon, like in the next week or so it should be out on submission. All right. So, fingers crossed. Yeah. Hopefully we're going to, you know, make a big splash with that one. <laughs> I believe you will. You will. You've made a huge splash with that. This one, uh, Carolina built it's a beautiful book. Thank you so much for coming and spending some time with me tonight. I really appreciate it. Thanks for having me. <laughs> yeah. And everybody out there, go grab this book. You, it is like, you're going to relate to so much of it. You get swept up in this domestic story. Like you, you're going to love it. Everybody go grab it. And the cover is gorgeous. So <laughs> for, no, for no other reason, put that book on your shelf. Good night, everybody. Uh, stay safe. Have a drink, read a book. Good night. Bye y'all. <laughs>